Okay, what's going on guys? In this video, I'm gonna be taking you through six exercises that target the back and biceps that you can put together into a complete pull workout, or you can pick and choose the movements you'd like to add to your own training split. All right, so as usual, we're starting the workout with a quick five minute general warm up on the treadmill or Stairmaster, and then doing a few quick dynamic stretches to get the joints nice and loose. From there, we're jumping into three sets of 12 to 15 reps on the one arm half kneeling lat pull down. So for these, you wanna take a half kneeling stance, bracing your non-working hand against the knee of the same leg. Having this more stable base of support will direct tension more efficiently onto the lats where you want it. As you pull, try to keep the cable in your forearm in a straight line. If you notice that your forearm is meeting the cable at a different angle, you may have the cable set too high or too low, or you could be pulling the weight back too far. With these, you should stop the range of motion at the midline since the lats lose all of their leverage once the arm goes back behind the torso. Now, some of you guys may remember that I used to do sideways facing lat pull-ins to kick off my pull workouts, where you pull the cable in toward your body from out to the side. So the one arm lat pull-in targets the lats through biomechanical shoulder adduction, whereas the one arm lat pull down to the front targets the lats through biomechanical shoulder extension. And both will hit the lats effectively. However, over the last couple of years, I found that some people feel a better mind-muscle connection with their lats by pulling down to the front rather than pulling in from the side. That could be because the teres muscles overpower the lats for some people with the pull-in, but both the teres and the lats perform both biomechanical functions, so I suspect this is mainly just an individual thing. I can personally feel my lats firing on both, so I still use both periodically, although I have been favoring the pull-down over the pull-in lately. And as of now, until we get a direct hypertrophy study comparing the two, which doesn't exist yet, I'd say to just roll with whatever one you feel hitting your lats harder, or if you feel them both equally well, you can periodically rotate them in and out. Okay, after that, we're doing one all-out AMRAP set for as many reps as possible on the pull-up. Now, normally on a pull day, I do multiple sets for pull-ups. However, since we already smashed our lats on the cables, I figured we'd just do one all-out set here. Also, I found that while calisthenic enthusiasts love pull-ups, a lot of bodybuilders don't seem to like them as much. And while I do think it's important that your training is enjoyable, I also think pull-ups are a great exercise worth including that you shouldn't avoid just because they're harder than lat pull-downs. So here's my compromise. You only have to do one set, but it has to be all-out. I think that's fair. So as an AMRAP set, each week you should try to at least match or ideally beat the number of reps you got the week before while maintaining the same consistent form. If you're bulking, just matching the number of reps should be enough to present an overloading stimulus because as you gain weight, you're adding resistance. But if you're cutting, you should try to add at least one rep each week because as you lose weight, you'll be lowering the resistance. Technique wise, take a 1.5 times shoulder width grip, lift your chest up and think about pulling your elbows down and in until they're as close to your sides as you can get them comfortably. Assuming it's a straight bar, you should at least try to get your chin up over the bar or at least try to get your chest to the same level as your hands. Also, if you can't do bodyweight pull-ups, you can use an assisted pull-up machine, or you can add assistance using a band. Just wrap the band around the bar, hook your foot into the bottom of the band, and it'll provide some assistance as you do your reps. All right, up next, we're doing three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the croc row. Now, a croc row is essentially just a more loose dumbbell row with a slightly more upright posture and a little more controlled cheating. It's named after a world record holding powerlifter, Janae Kroczaleski. One thing I've noticed over the years is that some science-based lifters have a tendency to be more strict with their form, and I think they really need to be. Sometimes this is great because it allows for consistent progression tracking, but sometimes it can hold you back if you're severely limiting the load you're capable of using in the name of perfect technique. I think that as a beginner, yes, you should try to be as strict and consistent as you can as you learn the proper technique, but once you've mastered the technique basics, I don't think there's anything wrong with using a little controlled body English on select movements, especially if it allows you to overload the target muscle more effectively. Plus, most of the best bodybuilders I know aren't super stiff when they lift. They allow their body to move and sway naturally, with the most important thing being that you're always in control of the weight, especially on the negative. Now, of course, if you don't feel comfortable using some momentum on these, it's okay to do them with stricter form and lighter weights. However, the downside of only ever using ultra strict form with the back in particular is that the strength curve of most back exercises is actually very unique in that it's super easy at the bottom and then much harder at the top. So if you stop at the first sign of any technique loss, let's just say you can't get that full squeeze at the top, so you terminate the set, you may be stopping well shy of the point of where your back is fully stimulated. So just using a little bit of momentum at the bottom can help your back approach that point of true exhaustion much more effectively. Obviously, I wouldn't use cheating on every exercise, but from time to time, I think it can be useful as an intensity technique. Okay, after that, we're doing three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the cable shrug-in. These are nice because you don't need to load up any plates, so they're a quick and convenient upper trap option. 
Also, the orientation of the cables tend to line up better with the orientation of the upper trap fibers, which don't run nearly as vertically as many people think, but actually fan out more horizontally. So shrugging both up and in is likely best for hitting as many of those upper trap fibers as possible. That's also why I generally recommend a slightly wider grip when doing barbell shrugs, as it'll force you to shrug up and in, not just straight up and down. All right, up next, we're doing three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the reverse pec deck. On these, the main thing to focus on is sweeping the weight out and back, not just back. This will help you target the rear delts more than the muscles of the mid back, which can easily take over if you aren't being intentional with your form. If you just pull the weight back, you're going to shift a lot of the emphasis onto the mid traps, which isn't a big deal if that's what you're going for, but we've already smashed the mid traps with pull ups and crock rows, so I'd much rather isolate the rear delts here since they are usually overpowered by the bigger back muscles in those compound movements. Another thing you can try is varying your grip position from set to set. So you can start with your palms facing one another for set one, then put your palms facing down for set two, and then if your shoulders allow it, internally rotate a bit on set three. I personally feel the best mind-muscle connection with my rear delts by using the second or third hand position. However, there seems to be a lot of individual variability with this. A 2013 study from Brad Schoenfeld and colleagues found that, on average, EMG readings were higher for the rear delts with a neutral, or palms in, hand position than with the pronated, or palms down, hand position. However, if you dig into the individual data, you'll see that there was substantial variation. Some subjects displayed greater activity with internal rotation, others with neutral rotation. And in some cases, the differences were pretty big. Now, of course, all the usual caveats about EMG research apply, but at the very least, I think this shows us that if you've only ever used one hand position on the reverse pec deck, it's definitely worth playing around with the others as you could be leaving some rear delt gains on the table. Okay, and to finish off the workout, we're doing three sets of 10 to 12 reps on the overhead cable bicep curl. For this one, you wanna kneel down and curl with your arm out to the side and up overhead. Now, I don't often do overhead curls because I've always found them to be a bit awkward, but I recently saw natural pro bodybuilders, Alberto Nunez and Brian Minor doing these at the N1 training lab where they were comparing two different shoulder positions on bicep curls, one with the arm down and one with the arm up. And they found that for both Alberto and Brian, there seemed to be a bias toward the long head of the biceps when the arm was held up overhead as opposed to down to the side. Now, just as a quick refresher, the long head of the biceps is the outside part and is what contributes more to that elusive bicep peak that so many people try to target. Now, obviously, I don't want to overstate the findings here. There are already a lot of limitations with EMG data. And as we already discussed from the Schoenfeld paper, muscle activation patterns are highly individual. However, I did find it interesting enough to start playing around with overhead curls again myself, especially since bicep peak has always been a weak point for me. So at the very least, I think it's one of those things worth experimenting with for yourself. This is usually the only bicep movement I do on this day, but if you feel like you need a little more extra direct volume for progress, feel free to include another couple sets of curls where the arm is more down to the side or stretched back behind the torso. Now, if you'd like to have all these workouts laid out in one place and organized into a progressive 12-week training program, you can check out my ultimate push-pull legs hypertrophy system over on jeffnipper.com. The workouts I've been doing in this series come from phase one of the program, which lasts for the first six weeks. And then after that, there are two entirely different phases designed to build on one another and keep things progressing. And if you'd like to learn more about that program and see if it's right for you and your goals, you can check out the first link in the description box down below. All right, that's it for this one, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll See you guys all here in the next one.